my name is Ferris Alami, and I'm your. I'm going to go walk you through today the Resilient Entrepreneur Canvas, and I'll walk you through a little bit of my personal journey and how I came up with that canvas and how it's been going on now for the last four years. It's hard to believe that this is canvas has now been going on for four years. I always like to hear, although I, as you know, you've signed up for this webinar, you might know already what you want to get out of it, and you already know what we will get you out of it, which is the Canvas. And I would love to hear from you, just in the chat or in the question and comment answers, what would you like to get out of today's discussion? Just quickly on what we should expect today. This is what we will cover. I'm going to, have to cover a little bit about the expectations. I'm going to talk about the personal journey. I'm going to talk about the Canvas. And I'm going to walk you through the mindset, the self-awareness, the business, the moving forward, and the next steps that you could take with this canvas. Well, it's always an honor for me to know where you're calling from. So maybe in the chat, you could tell us the city or the country you're calling from or that you're joining us from. You could always add if you're calling from your office or from your car or from your home or from the airport, <laughs> I'm always uh, amazed and uh, honored to have you join us from all over the place. For those who don't know, uh, I'm the founder of a company called International Strategic Management. And basically we do consulting services and advisory specifically on the economic development area. Many times you might hear the terminology technical assistant or program development or capacity building or coaching. That's the space that I work in with my team. And we're lucky to have been working in this space for the last 20 some years. We have touched over 250,000 entrepreneurs, probably you know low estimating that number. And we have touched so many countries throughout the journey that we've done. I just wanna make sure that you know that the limitation that I work in, which is usually we're talking about globalization, we're talking about entrepreneurship, talk about education, talk about the community, and we're talking about technology. And that kind of space and that kind of aroma is really what we're talking about here in this space. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if this is your first time joining, I just wanna make sure that you clearly understand where we work. We have two tracks. We have a track for those, what we call ESOs and EDOs, people who are in the space of economic development or support for entrepreneurs. Then we have a track for the entrepreneurs or leaders or the small business owners themselves. On one track, we're doing mainly program design, capacity building, program assessment, things of that nature. And in the other track, which is the entrepreneurs and SMEs, myself and my team, usually working with the entrepreneurs or the small business owner on strategy or training or business advising or business coaching or any of the program that we might have deployed in collaboration with our partners. This work has been done over 101 countries. Occasionally they'll come here with like our capacity building tour. We just did a couple of programs last year from Kazakhstan to Egypt to Saudi and a few other countries where they might come here for a week, half the day's training, half the day's touring. And so we have had some that extended that to more than, I think the maximum we've ever done it is usually six weeks. I'm not gonna bore you with these numbers because you could look those numbers up on our website. This might help you understand who usually uh, work with us or support us or who you, where we, where did we get the gain, the experience that we have today. So usually it's usually nonprofit, a university or a government agency that engages us in the program side of things. And then the entrepreneurs come through in collaboration with these agencies that we work with. There are over 20 some programs that we usually deploy from. Some are our own, some are different brands that we carry and some that we might have developed or customized for the specific organization that we worked with. In addition to international strategic management, I run a, pro, a nonprofit called Connecting Dots, which basically works on entrepreneurship with a focus on youth. And then I do have a podcast that's weekly as well as a blog. And then of course, we're now able to license our Resilient Entrepreneur Canvas, which we're gonna walk you through today or the program for institutions to deploy it in their local community on their own under our umbrella. In addition to the ISM, I'm going to call it family of businesses. Uh, we also work with other brands like Global Entrepreneurship Week, Kiva. We are the trustee where we can endorse 
companies up to $15,000 of loans with zero interest. We're uh, close work with Growth Wheel, Fast Track, and Startup Grind, and many others. Uh, this year, we also just signed up a new agreement with Lendio, where we could also additionally allow companies to apply for funding. I'm lucky to have this work all over the world, from underserved to over to uh, you know maybe over <laughs> served communities, and all over the world. I've been lucky to speak on this work globally on an average on a yearly basis, somewhere between ten to twenty engagements, just for me to go uh, articulate or engage in this kind of conversations about entrepreneurship or small business development or establishing those centers in their communities or economic development in general. I have a couple of books. These are my two latest. One is called The Power of Seven in Marketing and the one is called Start Where You Are. Uh, the Power of Seven is about relationships and managing your relationships with potential customers. And then the Start Where You Are is understanding that you could start wherever you are with whatever you have, utilizing the canvas that we're going to discuss today. Both of these books do come with what I call workbooks, where you could actually work through the book as you go read the book. The work we've done, fortunate to have had lots of coverage on it, from Diversity Professional Magazine to major newspapers to national television and international television to many local televisions throughout the world when we're traveling. And I've been lucky to have been on many of the amazing podcasters, other people podcast, and as well as I've been able to host so many people on the podcast that I host. Just a quick background, originally from Palestine, from Gaza specifically, actually, and uh, grew up in Kuwait, moved to the U.S. during the first Gulf War. Many of you might not remember that, 1990, when Iraq invaded Kuwait. Uh, three months out of the invasion, I was, uh, I was basically forced to leave to move, and I've been in the U.S. since then. My journey was rough, just like many of you who are maybe listening to us today and many of the people who are in a rough situation today. Uh, initially, when I first moved in, uh, having to move from my one you know, little place to live in to a mosque, to a few people's homes, as, a, as one of my friends called it, your homeless fairs. And as I was homeless, I was able to start a T-shirt company that initially focused on supporting the nonprofits, raise funds for their causes, and then I learned how to bring perfumes and colognes and sell it, where I expanded for almost over 500 people in six different states. And with time, I learned how to sell things on the internet. So I had an online store. And then in 2000s, I started working in the retail space, although I've always been in retail since the Gulf War and before. And throughout that journey, I learned a few tricks, and throughout that uh, idea of becoming an executive in some of these bigger chains, I launched in 2003 International Strategic Management with a focus on supporting entrepreneurs and small businesses in the underserved, underrepresented communities. And today, as you saw earlier, I've been fortunate to have done it in over 100 countries. I carried most of my life a travel refugee document issued by Egypt, sitting that I'm Palestinian, and my mom from my, from my parents' side, carried that refugee document from the United Nations stating that she is a refugee from the 1948 war. And that's how I grew up most of my life carrying these documents until I became a U.S. citizen. And then I was able to become, uh, I was able to hold the U.S., uh, you might call it <laughs> refugee document or travel document that you see here to the right. My right, probably your left, I'm not sure. So how it started, it was really simple. I grew up in this amazing family home where family and friends and neighbors were really important. My grandparents from my mom's side and my grandparents from my dad's side. And then just, you would never know that I had what you might think of a refugee or being a refugee. And you can see from my mom and dad's engagement party, it looked like things are normal. We traveled every year, mainly to Gaza, to spend our summers there, most of the time till, till we couldn't go anymore. And you could see through the journey that we've had, we've always had some friends and family around us, and there's always food. Uh, if you know, if you like food, you're going to love hanging out with the family. <laughs> Until I 
had to face the high school challenge where basically being in Kuwait, once I became a high schooler, I could no longer stay because I'm no longer a adult, I'm no longer under the family restrictions of becoming an adult. So having to find a different way for us to immigrate, we thought of Canada initially so we could become Canadian and live in Canada and also get my college degree there as well. Unfortunately, with the eyes on Canada, a 1990 uh, war comes in, we had an appointment to go to the Canadian embassy to get the visa, but unfortunately with the war coming in, we did not make that appointment and plans had to change. But carrying these documents didn't give you any access to anything. Before, just to give you an idea, for me to travel anywhere, I first had to go to the Egyptian embassy to add the country that I wanted to visit. Then I had to go and apply to that country to visit. An example, if I wanted to go to Canada, I first had to go to the Egyptian embassy to add Canada to my travel refugee document and then go to the Canadian embassy to apply for a visa. And also when I came to the US, I ran into more challenges. Because when Kuwait got liberated, they basically announced that those who left could no longer come. And then my parents uh, went on order of deportation themselves in Kuwait, and many Palestinians got deported in Kuwait at the time, back in 1991, which basically made me somewhat uh, in a bad situation. So I asked a lawyer, and they suggested I should apply for political asylum to ref as a refugee. And then throughout that process, I end up having to be going through order of deportation and then what they call order of supervision. And then I had a bunch of what they call run letters. Run letters basically means you get one of these letters and then you have one day usually or maybe two days to pack up 44 pounds of luggage, sometimes 40, just depending on the time. And then you were supposed to be leaving the country the next day uh, as a one-way ticket. Lucky for me, being a Palestinian, I didn't have to do that because none of the countries accepted it. And in the run letter, the, uh, the, the supervision letter, you can see here to the right in the back, there's some handwriting because on a monthly basis, sometimes quarterly basis, sometimes uh, every other month, just depending on the mood of the deportation officer, I had to report back in person and sit there for somewhere between two to eight hours once a month for someone to know that I was there. Lucky in a way because they could have easily detained me, but they chose not to. My story was really, um, I'm going to call it under the radar most of the time, because I didn't really share much with much, many people throughout my journey. And the few people that I shared with, I got, uh, I'm going to call it uh, really kind of like a bad taste from sharing my story with them. So I kept the story even closer after the few times I shared it. Till 2006-ish, when I got one of those run letters and my wife was pregnant with our firstborn, and she really wanted us to do something and get it solved. And that's when we went out and got the message a little bit out. And we got some support from uh, the senators and some of the government officials here. The newspaper made a nice article. Then we had the Al Jazeera come and do a documentary. We had a local channel come do some, you know, some uh, documentary as well, like a three or four minute segment. And we got some coverage about the story. And since then, I've been a little bit more open about sharing the struggle that I personally have gone through, really without, you know, up to you know, almost 15 years since it was started. As I become a U.S. citizen, you know, I would like to highlight one thing. I came from what, you know, what, from a place as one of the officials told me, you can't refugee from a place that does not exist. And when I got my travel document initially, it basically said I was stateless because it did not recognize Palestine as a country. That just made my process a little bit harder than most people. That's all I wanted to say. Since I became a citizen in 2012, I've been fortunate to have American passports. And sometimes I got the UN passport, you know, for a few trips. So that allowed me to have a whole different access than I've ever had before. I share that with you because a lot of times we see things just in black and white or just how we might have seen it based on how we grew up or based on the facts that was presented at the time as facts when they were not really facts. Excuse me. And when you look at this image, you might think black and white. And I've had people be creative and I would love to hear what you have to say about it as you see it from map to images to moon to the wall to all kinds of stuff. And I'd love to hear what you see in this black and white. You could go ahead and put it in. 
And what I learned through my journey is as we see things as we think they are, when someone come in and helps us really see the reality of what it is, it's really hard to see it. It's actually only imaginary. And our imagination could never really imagine what the reality is because we're just creative people, usually. Even those who tell me they're not creative, I find them very creative when I ask them, describe what you see in this black and white. But once you get that frame and reality, I'm going to call it the real picture of what I wanted you to see versus what you think you might want to see because of your imagination or no imagination. Once you get that frame, it becomes really harder for you not to see what is really happening. And I'm hoping through this process, what I share with you, the canvas, it allows you to see what you could see and leverage what you have without you having to go through the struggle of trying to figure out it's just another photo that you don't know and you don't understand. So let's jump in. Once I give you this frame, and let's just call it, in this case, the resilient canvas, what you will see is right away, you're going to be able to identify what you're seeing. And you're going to be, once you identify what you're seeing, yes, I see <laughs> some of you might be thinking, yeah, I see the cow now. It's very clear. I'm glad that you see it. You see the eyes, you see the nose, you see the body, you see the ears, two of them, right? So once you see that, it makes it really hard not to be able to leverage it moving forward. Because if I go back to that image, you would be wondering right now, how did I not see it? It's right there. Well, because you didn't have the frame. So I'm sharing that with you because I don't think what I'm going to share with you is any top secret. I don't think what I'm sharing with you is like life-changing event. It was for me. It was for many others. But it's also in you. The question is, how do you use it? How do you put it to work? How do you make it happen? And this frame of reference will allow you to do that. So therefore, next time there's an opportunity for you to be resilient, you don't have to think too hard about being one because you are already one. And then you could just follow the process. Now, for me, it became clear because unfortunately, I lived like that all my life. And then all the people I worked with, Many of them did not know, but many of them also had their own struggles, whether they were themselves refugees or they're themselves underserved or they were themselves denied access to all kinds of stuff. They had to figure it out. But on when COVID hits and I took the last flight from Saudi Arabia to Detroit, it became clear to me that there is a need for such service throughout the world. And as I started having these calls on a weekly basis in, in March of 2020, it became clear that I might have repeated myself or learned from the others that they were repeating themselves, but just by different people without them knowing what this reference is. So I took the time and drew out what the process was for every individual who kept going and even got stronger with challenges. And as I did that, it became clear that there is a canvas that you could follow. Can't say it's comprehensive, but I will say that will get you started, right? And it started really with the mindset of how people think. It went to the self. It had some business. Now, you could replace business with leadership. You could replace business with home. You could replace business with organizations, whatever you want. But I'm kind of looking at here in business. And this is why I've been able to talk about this topic in so many different ways. And then about moving forward, how to move forward with these ideas. So let's break it into down to the segmentation that we went through. So the first thing under the mindset, there were really three categories, entrepreneurship, leadership, and compassion, or empathy. These things were in every single person that was resilient that I worked with or had a conversation with. It might have been different orders. They might have been leaders before entrepreneurs. They might have worked as an employee, but they had the entrepreneurship, I'm going to call it mindset. <clears throat> Excuse me. What's the mindset? It's just a way of thinking, right? They had a leadership, meaning they had to take a step and make it happen. And they had a compassion or empathy. I'm not saying that you can be any other way. You can. I'm just saying the people I worked with, these are the things that they resembled. And their self, they were aware of what's happening around them, to acknowledge what's happening, to understand what's going on. They were able to freak out. The challenges, you couldn't just say freaked out, right? You had to freak out for a minute and then move on to what I call action. I got to freak out. This world is ending. World is a big problem. Well, now what? Moving to these smaller action steps for that day or for that moment made them able to keep moving forward. 
and a lot is two things under self-awareness is checking the facts and understanding where the information is coming from. Because many times when there's a resiliency coming through, you might be getting some information from the wrong resources and it's the wrong information. You have to be able to separate the real information from the fake information and be able to know who's the source that you should trust or who's the source you should let go. And around me, you got to be able to be to see who's around you, who's supporting you, who's not. And there's nothing wrong when you get people who don't want to support you. Just being aware of who they are and why they're doing it, right? So understanding what can you leverage and what you could let go of because you can't control. I can't control what's happening to me. If it happened, it happened. I can't control where I'm at. If I can, if I can't control it, then I got to also let go of it. I have to let go of what I call you can't things you cannot control. And you have to look at these challenges that you may be facing about opportunities that you could be creating. I became homeless, became an opportunity. I had more time in my hand. What did I do? I volunteered, right? You could figure out or, or try to find a job, right? So you have more time on your hand to do something. Not saying that it's always perfect. It's just a process that you want to start. And you have to repurpose. In my case, I had to repurpose my bags from carrying my clothes to carrying maybe a sleeping bag, right? To get rid of some of the stuff that I couldn't keep. So you have to repurpose what you got with you at the time. And you have to know that when you are looking around you, you might be the first person taking that step. You got to lead. And you got to accept the fact that maybe no one will support you till you get to the next destination. And then my people might be able to support you or that you might be the only one moving forward with it. Once we're done with the self-awareness, now we can move to the business side. On our business side, you can see that there are four you know, boxes there. And I'm going to call them, think about what you have, think about what you could leverage, think about what you could pilot or offer, and then think about what you could pilot. And if you think about it in that kind of way, the three to four ideas, what do you have? Think about talent, think about money, think about access to resources or information, whatever you have. How can you leverage it? How can you allow yourself to leverage what you have? An example I usually use, I'm a member of a chamber. How can I leverage it? Join a committee. Make sure that I contribute in a positive way to the community that I'm in, right? What can you offer? Well, as you go through, you might realize you could offer a different service than what you offered. Maybe I was offering insurance for individuals, but now I could offer insurance for organization or the other way around. I was offering organiz organization insurance and now I want to offer individuals. And you got a pilot. Pilot meaning try it. Always start with this, I'm going to call it a smaller circle that you may have, whether people you know or not. It doesn't really matter. I try to usually do things with people I don't know because then it allows me to really get feedback and see what happens and then launch it. There are some things that I usually like to try with some closer people because I don't want to expose my not knowledge on that one specific area and work it with the individuals that could potentially be really candid and, you know, and honest about what I could improve on. So you have to decide what's the right fit for you at the time, but that's what you do. And then once you're done with that, then you could move forward, right? And the moving forward is really in the five categories, operation management, time, safety and security, and communications, both internally and externally. I summarize for you what I would do, and obviously in 14 weeks, usually we spend you know a couple hours a week talking about it and then strategizing and coming with a specific plan for each individual. But I wanted to give you like this whole canvas right up front so that we could learn how to use it yourself. You can download it on our website, obviously for free, and there is no cost for you to do that. And of course, we do have programs that will walk, walk you through it or you can do it self-paced, but I just wanted to make sure that you get a nice overview of it right away. One thing I will mention here is you want to stay consistently ready to adapt whatever changes happens, because what you think today might change tomorrow or might change even the same day. And what I will say with entrepreneurship, keep looking for those opportunities and how you could convert it from an, you know, either a problem that you want to solve or an opportunity you want to create in the places that you're in at the time. And just know it's a journey. It's not going to be done. And you have to know that it takes time to grab that opportunity. It might not fold or unfold right away. And in the leadership, just be aware of who's around you and surrounding you. And then just know that you got to always keep moving forward. One thing I want to mention about the mindset is make sure that you understand 
the difference between being a victim versus victorious. And I want you to know that no matter what, I'm sorry that when we face challenges that we face them. Think about my family today and what, what's happening to them and my friends and people I know all over the world that are unfortunately being either oppressed or being subject to you know, oppression. It's easy to feel victim, right? In the same time, if we could think about how we could be victorious because of what's happening, it could potentially help us move an inch closer to at least having a hope of what could come out of where we are today. So developing this mindset, it takes time, and it's not an overnight. What I want to say next is I want to mention, uh, you know, one of the things I usually mention is ISM. And my experience with ISM, we initially, as you know, we were delivering programs all over the world, and when, you know, and then we had to shut down really quick and rethink it. And then we had to reopen again and rethink it. Throughout all of these times, we really just always focus about one to three programs initially to try them. And as we succeeded in them, we adopted to additional programs. Uh, one thing I want to mention before I let you go here today, as you go through resiliency, think about startup mode and growth mode. Some of you, as you go into resiliency, are able to shift your company from a startup mode to growth mode and go and invest, while others might have been in growth mode, but then they have to shift down to a startup mode. The difference is really simple. When you startup mode, you work with the resource that you have, and you only work with what you have as you need it, when needed, when you can. With a growth mode, you're making investments on counting on or thinking of the future. No right or wrong, just depends on who you are and what you got going. Two different strategies you might want to think about. I was lucky and I've been lucky to be in Detroit to watch some of these things happen also unfold in the cities and with the people that I around. And I use this example because here in Detroit, this one building I drove by every day since 2004, and I continue to drive through it almost every day uh, till now, so 20 years later, and it's changed a lot. Now, I had no contribution to making that change. I was part of the individuals in the area that happened to watch and observe and, you know, play a small role around it. But noticing that it's changed, it was becoming clear to me that there is a whole bigger movement than what I or the individuals that I work with or the organization work with as a group even can do or not. But it made a change. And in the same building in 2014, it looked a little different. And today, thanks to Google Maps, you could go and see what it looked like in 2009 and what it looks like now. I stopped in 2017 to just get an image of what it was. You can go today and see what it looks like. But this is Google showing you what it looks like back in 20, 2009 and what it looks like today. And I say that because Detroit had a lot of, as you many of you know, bad press for a long time. And with that, it might hopefully give you an idea that it could be much bigger than what you're doing if you allow it to be. I'm going to stop right here and ask you to please give me a one word about today's program. Put that in the chat or in the comment area. Love to hear it. Love to see it. And for those who were asking about my books, thanks for asking. Uh, you could buy you know, the Build Resiliency, which is a book and a workbook. You can see those there, as well as the Power of Seven, which is now we have converted to a program. You can still buy the books, but if you want to get the program, it's a maybe better deal. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so you could go in and uh, buy the book as well as the workbook. You could see that there's a book and a workbook with it to work you through to establish relationship and business strategies in, in the space of the marketing specifically, but in general in business. We are offering right now one-year membership where you get uh, self-paced online courses specifically for the Resilient as well as the Power of Seven workbook. You can either subscribe for 27 bucks a month and you'll have access to these online courses as well as monthly emails to check in from our team to see how you're doing and response from us. Of course, we'll you know if you have goals or we help you set up some of the goals and we keep track of it. And then there'll be a quarterly coaching opportunities where we actually have an open call for people to join a call and have a coaching session. And then the access to this material, once you finish the course, we let you have it for life. There are, of course, lots of workbooks that you will go through, as well as a signed copy of the book as well. Those who are interested, you could just right now either read more about it by scanning it with your phone, or you could, you know, option to finance. We do have 
option to finance ourselves, or you could obviously pay it yourself through your credit card, but we do offer a financing option, either 27 bucks a month or $22.99 for the year. For those who are interested in giving us feedback, please feel free to give us feedback. Without your feedback, I wouldn't be where I'm at today, and I really appreciate you taking the time to give us feedback. Usually it's three to five questions, what you like, what you don't like, what I could improve, what you would like to see. And then any other comments. That's pretty much it. For those who would like to stay in touch with me, you could you know, use your phone again to download my contact information to your phone. I do have a WhatsApp for those who are overseas and uh, my email is here as well. I wanna thank you for being with us today. I wanna to thank you for giving me the chance to be with you and share with you the Resilient Canvas and a little bit about my journey and how I came up with it. And I wanna thank those 5,000 leaders throughout the initial year of 2020 that allowed me to listen to them, reflect on them, as well as challenge them and encourage them as they were going through those challenges back then that allowed me to frame this resiliency through reflection of 20 some years of being in the space, as well as the countries that I worked with, as well as all the people that I met throughout my journey. Till next time, I'm honored for you being with us. Thank you so much. This is the Resilient Entrepreneur Program and Canvas. Feel free to stay in touch. Have a good day.